Well, hi again, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Inside Furman Athletics. I am Dan Scott, voice of the Paladins. Very happy to have you with us. And as you can tell, it's our monthly visit with J.D. the A.D. Jason Donnelly is here, and also Robert Gary for the first part of our program. His uh, cross-country team's continuing to do fantastic things here on the Furman University campus. Robert will be with us for the first half, and then Jason here to talk about a number of things afterwards and answer some of your questions that you submitted to us. And, Dan, if you don't mind, I wanted to get started with one thing, and just to actually thank you. I don't know if our fan base realized what you've done over the last three or four days, and, and I, it's worth talking about, Robert. Uh, we've had quite a schedule. You know, we've reached that intersection in the season where you go between football and basketball and cross-country, volleyball, soccer. We've had a ton of stuff going on. Uh, but you, Dan, personally have had a lot going on when it comes to travel. Uh, we've had home basketball games, away basketball games, home football games, and then you came right back for another away game. But can you tell us about your travel over the last, I'd say, three to four days? Yeah, going back to Friday of last week when Furman basketball played in Louisville, Tom Van Hoy and I uh, left out of here about 9 o'clock in the morning to uh, head to Louisville got to the KFC Yum Center, which if, if anybody has ever been to that place, it's it amazing. is phenomenal. Yep. That that venue is just incredible. Might Matter of fact, I think Bob Ritchie was going to bring back some architectural plans for you to look at. Oh, he, uh, yeah. he did. He did. <laughs> he did, and, and Raymond Newsom did, and, and some of our donors. But that might be the nicest arena in the it, country. It, it was simply incredible. So we did that basketball game, which, oh, by the way, Went to overtime, which the Paladins won. <laughs> and uh, it's about a six, six-and-a-half-hour drive without stops from there to campus and with stops and coffee. Mm-hmm. And, and did I mention coffee? Oh, a lot of coffee. Uh, on, on the way back, I walked back into my office here at 5 o'clock on Saturday morning, laid down on the couch in the other room for a couple of hours, couldn't really get it. Number one, it was freezing in here. And number two, I had a lot of coffee running through. And me. no, you didn't go home. No, no. You came straight to the stadium. No, if I'd have gone home, yep. it would have been another almost two hours combined driving time. So I stayed here and uh, got a lot of stuff accomplished between about 8 a.m. and, and uh, the time we went on the air for the football game. Did the football game, went home. I think I was in bed dead by about 8 p.m. Uh, and then we uh, get up on Monday and drive to Nashville and back, and I walked into my house this morning at uh, about 5 a.m. Thank you, Dan. And so, it just, and but, he, but, you know, it, it's the job, Yep. and, and, and uh, I enjoy it. We travel. Um, listen, I'd much rather be doing what I'm doing than what, for instance, Wesley Herring is doing in the sports information mm-hmm. office. He's not traveling, but he's handling about, I don't know, eight, ten sports right now yeah, and Wesley by and himself. Were, we were emailing last night, probably 10, 11 o'clock at night, giving an idea of our communications team, and they're had, handling multiple different mm-hmm. things. And we're going we're gonna to get to Coach Gary about what everything's going on with them as well. But, Dan, I just want to say thank you. Um, sometimes when people, they don't get this, they see you on the air and they see the great work that you do but they might not understand the, the complexities and all the work that goes into being committed the way that you are, and we really appreciate it. And I, I had said to you a few weeks ago, I said, hey, are you good for football and basketball? Can you, can you do it all? And, and you said, without certainty, you said, absolutely. You said, I got this. This, and, is, this is the first time, Jason, and I'm in my 11th season. It's the first time I can remember that we have not had a direct Saturday football-basketball conflict in the scheduling. So I haven't had to find somebody else to go do an early season basketball game, which meant that I actually got to call the Louisville upset. I didn't get to call the Villanova upset three years ago because we had a football game mm-hmm. that day. Uh, but um, it, it's fun. Tom and I enjoy the travel. And uh, bottom line, one of my favorite quotes from Jim Bouton's famous book, Ball Four, is the world doesn't want to hear about the labor pains and only wants to see the baby. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares what it did, what it took me to get to a venue or Tom and I to get to a venue. They just expect us to be there. And when they say, now here's Dan Scott, they expect to hear my voice on the radio. Yeah, so well, two that's, over, that's what we do. Two overtime <laughs> games and the football game, it went the distance. But we, we the Paladin, and faithful, <laughs> thank you for that. And well, I appreciate it. I want to turn our attention to our man, Robert Gary, because he's busy, and, and we want to talk about everything that's going on with him. But, Coach Gary, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're, you're literally running around, or at least your athletes are, right? I think they're probably doing a lot more running than I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, t- tell us where you're at with everything so our, our fan base knows. Everyone's following you, and, and before we get started, I just want to congratulate you. Um, nine straight SOCON men and women's championships 
which just did anything you do when you're consecutive year in, year out, um, it just speaks volumes. But it's not just consecutive on one side or the other. This is the men and the women. Um, Robert is the head coach for both the men's and women's program. He's always uh, the men's and women's coach of the year as well, the awards that come with it. But this sustained success that you've had is really remarkable. And, and it's not, you know, there's not an obligation to win each year in and out, but there's some pressure that comes with that. But can you talk about the journey of what you're going through and what you guys are working on relative to the program? Yeah, I think it always um, culminates at the end of the year. That's always our first real big checkpoint. A lot of invitationals, um, kind of getting ready for it. But um, we take great pride in both programs kind of moving forward together. There's some programs throughout the country where one might be, you know, miles and miles ahead of another one. Um, but um, with my wife, Rita, um, on the women's side of things, uh, Coach Roberts, uh, Coach Neal, we really – we try to really combine that kind of synergy. Um, we always have the same, you know, goals as far as uh, defending our title. Um, this year, we were fortunate enough, ninth and nine in a row, um, and we really did so in a real dominating fashion. I think we have two of the strongest teams that we've ever had, particularly at the same time. So, from there on to um, on to our regional meet, which is also in the morning of the Louisville game. If we were a little bit better planners, we certainly would have loved to have stayed and watched the uh, basketball game. But um, just some great synergy, even from the whole weekend. You know, the whole team gets off, and uh, you know, we had a seven-hour bus ride we came home and uh came home and we got the whole team basically not not getting off the bus and instead watching the end of the basketball game two days later we got a big community service project with everybody but um for us we're really in our n2a stretch now um we leave for the n2a meet on thursday um, we have a men's team that's advanced and our women's program, probably the fifth or sixth team that uh, did not get an at-large bid, um, but we did have an individual in Bethany Graham on the women's side. So um, a men's team that I think can be as strong as we've ever had, maybe even peek, peek its head into the top 10 or even the top seven or something like that. Um, we feel like Bethany can uh, make a good run at getting an All-American certificate. And we have a women's team and half of a men's team that are all freshmen, um, not necessarily because of COVID, but um, really just because we're in a new wave and a new future. So I love that they haven't let the slack you know um at all not nine straight conference championships both the men and the women as jason mentioned is just an incredible accomplishment and every year you do that the target on your individual and collective backs gets larger and larger and larger from everybody else mr broadcaster forgot to turn his phone off but uh how have you been able to negotiate that part of things when when you are definitely the hunted and not the hunter well, we actually made a video of our very first win, our very first year, and one of the more depressing things is to see how much the coaching staff has aged as we've uh, <laughs> kind of gone through. But once we get through that heartbreak, um, I think the I think there's just a great culture of it. You know, the teams take great pride in doing it. Um, everybody loves going. We don't go and try to take it easy. We try to run as hard as we run any other invitational. We run all of our best, uh, you know, our best runners that are out there. They all want to get a championship ring. And one of the things we try to offer in recruiting is that you'll get to go to the H2A championships all four years and that you'll be a conference champion you know, four years. So uh, they really, they pick up the culture of it. Um, just as nervous for that race as any other race um, as we go. And like I said, it's really our first checkpoint of championship season. And to us, you know, the SOCON championships, uh, the regional championships, and then the N2A championships, that's how we really gauge our success. And, you know, that's the barometer we use with how the program's going. So I love where both programs are at. Obviously, I, you know, I don't like to see those crocodile tears, you know, um, when the women's program kind of figures out that we're not going to advance. But I love that they're disappointed. And, um, you know, I can promise you, um, you know, Louisville, regionals are back at Louisville next year, and I'd be absolutely shocked if we don't have both teams there. One of the things that really impresses me about your program, and I think it's, it deserves to be stated, is, is this unique gender-neutral um, attitude that you have relative to coaching in, in the sense that um, the men and the women are training together, competing around each other. Uh, there's so much of the program that works together, and I can understand how the women's program may be upset if they're not advancing. And, and what I love about it is that you're making them earn everything that they have um, one of the unique features of your program is the fact that you're both this competitive and the men and the women, and that you figured out a formula for what is successful out of Furman. Because one of the things, if, a, if the everyday fan might not be looking, if you went on paper and you looked at all the different groups that we're grouped in with, whether it's regionally or nationally, we're, ba we're basically competing against all of the power fives relative to size of institution and investment institution. Uh, where there are. There are a couple different programs like Northern Arizona that'll slip in there. They've also figured out how to do this nationally the way that you're doing it. Um, but how was your vision for this? How did, how did you get to the point where you said, okay, Furman, this is going back 10, 12 years to when you were thinking about this, but how did you have the vision for this to be successful as a model for both men and women? And what were some of the steps you took to make it this program that is today? 
Um, I think a good answer is probably the same way that the academic side of the um, campus would kind of answer. Um, you know, we don't have a million majors at Furman, but the ones that we have, you know, they're ones that we, we take very seriously. You know, we have good connections in the community. Um, our program has great donor support, great stakeholder interest. Um, we get great support from our, you know, senior administration. Um, you know, we're going and we've carved out a little bit of a niche of distance running, which, you know, campus has made. Um, you know, it's a great place to train, great weather um, to be able to go. Like I mentioned, we got, a, you know, I think we have the best coaching staff in the entire country with four distance coaches. All of us have each taken a program there by ourselves. So collectively, um, you know, that individualized attention, the same thing that, you know, we try to sell kids on as far as uh, the academic side of things go. I think that's one of the reasons why our kids develop. They stay healthy. Um, and we have a pretty big team, actually, with everybody doing so well and taking lots of people to these high-level meets. Um, you know, it really kind of goes on top. And they don't, don't care if it's a male or a female. They just care if it's an athlete or not. Um, so I think that's something that we've really just tried to build upon. And we're starting to get some great traditions, um, some great expectations. And one of our favorite things we always try to say is challenge is a privilege. Um, you know, I know some kids kind of shirk away from that. They don't want that kind of pressure. They don't want those kind of levels to be able to go. But I think we do a real good job. They expect it. They want it. We're clear about it in the recruiting process. And when we go here, um, we don't we don't let people fall through the cracks. Um, you know, the, the same kind of thing would be we don't have 600 person, you know, lecture halls over in the academic side of things where you can kind of put a hat on backwards and read the paper. Kind of how I did in college. Every <laughs> once in a while, so. Well, at least you're wearing your hat forwards. That's right. Now, yeah. how have you been able to, to keep the continuity in the coaching staff? Because as Jason knows from his coaching days and now, especially maybe even more so from his administrative jobs, when you have that kind of success, people want to come and start picking your coaches off and you've been able to maintain continuity. How have you been able to do that? Well, one of them, I hope, uh, I, I kind of have <laughs> locked up because um, if, you know, Rita's taking a job somewhere else, it's probably not good for uh, our marriage. But um, people have uh, looked, at, um, you know, they've called and inquired about um, Coach Roberts as well as um, Coach Neal. Both are very, very happy here. Um, they've carved out a niche here, um, you know, as well. Um, Chris has been with us uh, since the day we arrived, and he was tremendous uh, recruiting, um, working with our men's program. Um, we've got a great rhythm and a great routine. I'd, I'd hate to lose them, but at the same time, um, if and when it's time for them to kind of move on, I can't think of anything I'd take greater pride in than them, um, you know, leading their own program, because I know they're certainly ready to. I, well, think, I, I think I if we ask Rita, she would say she has you locked up, <laughs> as opposed to the other way around. But go ahead. 100%. <laughs> no, I think I think I can add to that too, Dan, and just watching the staff. Um, Robert governs the program with a lot of confidence, um, both his own abilities and the ability of the staff. So in a really unique way, um, I almost view Robert as the manager of the entire operation, the umbrella. You know, he's in charge of the men's and women's program. But I, I really look at, you know, Chris Neal is, he takes a lot of leadership role on the men's side. And Rita takes a lot of leadership role on the women's side. And Logan does a lot of the recruiting. So I think the role definition from within the program, um, the efficiency of the way it works together, Again, I go back to the whole nature that when – what's really unique about this program, when they travel, you know, it, it, traveling with you guys, it's really cool that when you're breaking down the race and you're going through the paces and you're going through the preparation, you do it for both teams at the same time. And mm -hmm. you're noting that the distance is different and the expectation is different um, relative to how they're running it, but the emphasis on what you're trying to accomplish is the same. And I think that's what makes this program really unique and really special. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that pursuit of excellence and what we're trying to go, and certainly there's going to be ebbs and flows of each program as they go on, but I've just had so many examples, I think, of both genders really excelling, and even also both genders struggling with this or that. So we're learning lessons. We're always trying to share that, you know, with people. But I feel incredibly confident to be able to kind of step away. Even when I went to be the world championship coach, I was gone for a month in the beginning of the year. I didn't have a single concern of, uh, you know, about it. both teams still advanced on. Um, you know, in fact, probably had to listen to Rita that we probably do better without me around. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we really, I think we really work well together. And to be perfectly honest, we really, we really enjoy each other. Um, we have a good time doing it. Um, and that's something that we always kind of talk about that, you know, is really at the, at the root of it for that we hope that all the kids experience as well. By, by the way, I think we need to revisit uh, and have a, a newlywed game part two that we, <laughs> that we did on the, the lunch and learn back in the COVID Zoom that was great. thing last year i think we may need to revisit that i don't know if kids still use the term street cred but you uh, bring you bring a lot of street cred to this mm -hmm. to this program because of, of of your success as a coach your success as an olympian world championship coach all of that uh, obviously that helps in, in the recruiting process but even at that i would imagine that can only go so far yeah, and I think also what you sometimes lean on is maybe some of the things that you struggled with. So they realize, geez, this is a struggle that this person had, whether it's 
hey, I had a hard time figuring out how to eat, um, how to study. You know, freshman year was tough for me. Uh, I mean, I had all those same kind of pitfalls. Um, you know, as we go on, I always like to joke that I made more Olympic teams than I made spring break trips. At my school, you had to score in the indoor meet to be able to go on a spring break trip. And it took me two or three years to really kind of get up and running. Um, not until I found the steeple did I have real national, you know, success. And I was a, I was a real surprise Olympian too. So not exactly a perfect trajectory as we've gone. And I probably share a lot more of the, you know, the bad stuff. They don't want to hear about um, the stuff that I did great. I think sometimes a better learning lesson might be where I struggled with things. I understand nerves at a race. I understand how hard it's going to be when they go off and, um, you know, they're trying to do A, B, and C. Even this weekend, we'll talk about it. I was someone at the national meet that qualified three times. One of them went great. Two of them were, you know, utter disasters. Um, and I think the utter disasters are good kind of scare tactics. You know, I'm a Chicago Cubs fan, so that's kind of <laughs> sometimes that's the area that I come from uh, as far as uh, coaching goes and lessons. But that's also where the synergy of our program kind of comes. We're all very competitive, but we're also competitive in a little bit different ways. You know, Rita likes to really get up and, you know, get after things. Um, Logan's much quieter. Uh, Chris is also really after it. I hardly talk until, you know, I'm, I'm really sure about everything I want to say. So we just have different styles, and hopefully we hit kind of the good chords on kids. One of the cool things with Street Cred also is, and I've had a chance to watch your program start to cycle through, your, your program does a great job of development, um, and I think other great organizations do this in a similar way, where, where the older uh, veteran runners will, will still the culture and, and the work ethic, and they lead the pack. And you, you definitely operate with a pack mentality. But one of the things that's been interesting to see also is now you've gotten to the point that not only are your runners achieving All-American status, champion status, NCA status, but they're also now becoming professional athletes uh, under your care. But can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your program as it relates not just you're going from the recruitment stage to the development stage, success stage and then the postgraduate professional development. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? I think one of the things we always try to talk about at the start of every season or every year at least is just getting to that next level, whatever that ring might be. Um, you know, we don't try to sell professional running, um, you know, to, you know, a, a senior in high school, but we do try to say, hey, if, if that's something that you're going to develop into, we feel like we have our eyes on doing that thing. We send kids to, you know, U.S. Junior Championships. We have vests. Um, Rita was also a national team coach. I'm very involved in, you know, being a national team coach. We just want to make people aware of it and sometimes just exposing people to those types of things um, gets them thinking about it, gets them changing, you know, some, a couple things that they really concentrate a little bit better on or whatever. And, um, you know, Know, nothing motivates like success. Um, and when you've seen someone that has gone through the program that just graduated, um, and then you look up and you go, boy, I ran as fast as he or she did in high school, or my sophomore year was very comparable. Now, if I can just make that next jump like Ryan Adams did, or Gabby Jennings most recently. Um, and I, I, I love that world. I love that world of post-collegiate and distance mm -hmm. running. If I didn't have people like that um, telling me, hey, I didn't even know about the Olympic trials when I graduated. Um, I went there more on a lark, um, uh, you know, and wasn't really going to go. But we had an Olympian that was coaching. He was in my event. And he said, hey, you should come and you should see. And it, it changed the trajectory of my life, not only athletically, but probably wouldn't even have gotten into coaching. I was all set to go to teach across America two days after the Olympic trials. I was a surprise winner. So we want to make sure that we always expose these kids to these things. And sometimes it's a challenge. Um, but um, um, like I said, challenge is really a privilege at our program, and we really take it very seriously when we come up with their goals. Well, we mentioned uh, a little earlier that uh, besides the nine straight SOCON titles, you went to the uh, NCAA regionals. Your men have automatically qualified for the NCAA tournament. Individually, Bethany Graham is going off for your women's team. So let's 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 concentrate on her because we you know the men are going as a group. You got one young lady who's representing your women's team. Tell us about Bethany Graham. Um, well, first off, you know, to speak to, you know, Jason's point, I still got the whole team out there training with her. Um, mm -hmm. So just making sure that she has everything that she needs, trying to keep it as normal as possible, um, you know, and just taking this week. They're going to take a break, you know, after after this week, but we did want to try to keep them all together. That's a group that's going to be at the NCAA championships next year and for the next three years, um, and they're really going to make, you know, some noise. We just were just too young. Bethany has um, completely gotten to another level. You saw a glimpse of it last spring, um, qualifying from the regional championships, just making the miss in the NCAA championships. And this year, uh, you know, I, I nickname her our, our little silent assassin. Um, she looks like she's about eight years old, um, but she's uh, she's a stone killer. Um, and I think uh, we saw a little glimpse of it early on, but at the Wisconsin Invitational, which is probably the most competitive invitational uh, in the country, she's up there banging away with people that have, have three or four All-American certificates back in their uh, dorm room. So um, she's done an excellent job. She dominated the SOCON um, cross-country meet, got right to the front on a very difficult course, beat another young lady from ETSU that was an All-American last year and really dominated the race. 
and at regionals, there wasn't one step that she took that I didn't think she was going to advance. She just plunked herself down in the top five. She was in the top five the entire way, looked very comfortable, um, very, very excited for her to do it. It's a, it's a hard charge to be the only person that goes to the meet. Um, in fact, Ali Bihalski, one of our um, uh, alums and one of the women, uh, she had a huge breakout race. Um, she had never been in the NCAA cross country chip. She ran, uh, she got seventh place out of nowhere the first time she went by herself too. Our team didn't, uh, didn't advance, but she told me that I had to be ready to warm up because I kept telling her that the only reason she got seventh is because I warmed up with her before the race. So I'm packing my shoes um, and excited <laughs> to get it done with Bethany. But that's where the men's and women's program rolling together really, really helps. Um, you know, she'll be right there with us. We all go to dinner together. We do everything together. We're on the bus together. They look out for her, you know, the whole time. So we've had that dynamic before also the other way where we had a whole women's team and just Aaron Templeton, he walked away with fifth place in the country. So, um, you know, it's, it's a good spot to be. Obviously, I'd love to have the women's program there, but that's going to breed some real fire that I think you're going to see not only, you know, next fall, but as early as the indoor and outdoor track season. One of the things I'm impressed with the program too, Robert, um, and we can't get into too many details because we're still working through the final stages of this communication, but there's things in progress. Um, and I'll give you a great compliment is, is you're constantly goal setting and, and you're constantly pushing to where you want to be. Um, and you do a really nice job of saying, here, what are we trying to accomplish? So you're looking at the different marks along the way. You look at the, the competitiveness of the individual races that you have throughout the year, both track and field cross country. You look at competing for the Southern Conference Championship. You look at competing regionals, nationals, all the things that you do. Um, I have no doubt that there's going to come a point where Furman will have an Olympian, you know, because of your program, and, and we're getting close. Uh, we had we had certain certainly a number of representatives this past year that were trying for that. Um, I also have a very um, optimistic uh, expectation, and there's no pressure to this, but I think Furman uh, cross country track and field. I don't know if it'll be the men or the women will have an opportunity to win a national championship, and we're we're working towards that. Uh, it was really inspiring to me when I first got here two years ago. Rita had a recruiting event. And she said to me, she goes, I need your help with this because this could be a national championship class. And, and she said that with conviction. She didn't just say that, that, hey, we're trying to do this. But there's, a, there's an emphasis here that to go try to win a national championship at Furman. Uh, one of the other goals built around the program has been the work that you've been doing um, with some of our donors, you know, and, and not to get too many names or into too many details. Uh, but can you talk about the process that, that you've been working on collaboratively with the university, with myself, with others, about trying to endow your program and what does that mean for the perpetuity of Furman Cross Country Track and Field? Well, I think COVID, um, there were some real um, concerns that you saw throughout the country. And you figure if it can happen there, maybe it can happen here. And I think it has people looking at how funding occurs, what needs to happen. Sometimes, you know, you're asked to take it. You know, seriously, you know, we're not, we have several donors that, um, that you know, obviously they want to see the program kind of continue on um, and they want to try to do it. And, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, you really throw yourself behind. We talk about goal setting all the time. I do consider myself the director of the program and it's a big deal to a lot of people. And so it's a big deal to me. So it's a big deal to the rest of my staff. So it's a big deal to the kids on the team. I think uh, learning how to give to a program, um, finding other ways to kind of fund, um, changing a model, not just standing there with a, with a hat out, um, you know, throwing yourselves on the mercy of, you know, a market or, or, or something else. Something gets endowed and all of a sudden um, you really feel like it's the most stable thing, you know, in the world. And it's probably as big a goal as trying to get our, you know, whole program, you know, uh, scholarships endowed, um, you know, sometime in the near future. Um, that's probably as big a goal as us getting a trophy at the um, NCAA championships. And I think they're very, I think there's great synergy in both. I think the excitement that builds from doing something like that, um, I think the place at the university, um, the kind of people horsepower that we have here at Furman, whether it's an athletic director coming down to watch the NCAA championships, whether it's donors flying out to see it, whether it's all the parents tailgating, we got a big group here. I know we're a small school and we're a small roster, but when you look up at some of these great events, we got a lot of people there that are very interested in what's going on. And tapping into, not tapping into that would be a real um, waste of energy. Well, I could just say, and, and uh, there's some big news coming, you know, around Furman Cross Country Track and Field. It's stuff that's in play and <coughs> things have been worked on. I just want to compliment you on, on the incredible vision that you've had, the shared vision uh, by others to, to, to figure out not only uh, how do we be competitive, but how do we sustain success? How do we sustain excellence? And how do we teach life lessons and all the different things that we're looking to do with this program? And just remarkably impressed with, with everything that you're doing in terms of the direction that it's going, big picture. I will tell, we'll tell everybody this, and um, this came up at our Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, one of our trustees said, well, how do we get to be a part of this race, and how do we do it? And then actually next year we're going to put the word out about the SOCON Championships uh, I had never been, and, I, and I've been around some great cross-country track and field programs before I got here. I've never been to a cross-country race. It is exhilarating. It, it's, 
not what you think. It's the opposite of what we know as fans, where you sit in the stands or you you sit in a fixed spot and you watch them. You yeah. you are literally a part of the race. Like you're moving and running, and the parents, the the student athletes that support each <laughs> other, um, the guy with the flag, whoever it is that, that's got the flag that's running, you just follow the flag from spot to spot, and you're kind of picking and choosing spots to go to where the race is going to come back to you. Um, and then Mr. Ponder, obviously taking all the great photos. He's got the media pass. He's figured that out. But I think going to a Furman cross-country track and field event is really remarkably fun, more, pe- more, more so than people know. But you want to talk about what that experience is like for you as a team and what that support feels like? Yeah, I think that kind of enthusiasm is just, uh, you know, it's infectious at all levels. You look over and you see the, um, the president um, honoring us, uh, you know, uh, for a SOCON championship, getting to go out to White Oaks and um, people showing up. Anytime you can get kind of people, but watching parents run around with their kids, I'm on a group me right now with all the parents, and I might have to get out of it before I lose my job because <laughs> they got a social calendar that's absolutely, uh, absolutely booked for this upcoming weekend. So, um, well, that's why you have all those other people do all the coaching, and you get to be the director, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm directing the tailgate, I guess, at this point. Um, but yeah, seeing everybody around there, seeing the excitement, um, I want people as excited about track and cross country and Furman um, University. I think uh, we've proven you don't have to be at a you know super power five school to be one of the best teams in the country um and so uh we want we want our parents excited about stuff we want um donors obviously senior administrators as many people as 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 possible uh that that's what makes it special i think i have to say you were remarkably cool a moment ago when your athletic director sitting just a few inches to your right turned to you and said in in effect that he expects a national championship out of, out of this <laughs> out of this program you, you didn't blink and, yeah. if, and i don't know if it's like the duck you know everything's cool up here and underneath that's yeah. going on, but you, you didn't flinch. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things I love about Jason is I, I know he's seen big picture. He, you know, it's, he's seen it happen at Villanova and um, I've told him and I, I tell him again, we want to get a trophy on the, uh, at the, at the cross country championships. We want to get people to NC2As, want to get an Olympian. Um, we've only, uh, we've only moved up our expectations of what we can do because we've become more and more sure that it can be accomplished here at Furman. The best. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Just you, you, you want to tell us before we wrap up your part of it uh, about the NCAAs coming up? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's on uh, Saturday morning. It's at Florida State uh, University. Um, the men are going to run 10,000 meters. The women, Bethany, 6,000 meters. Um, we feel like this uh, could be the best team that we've ever had. We don't have a super front runner, but we got a pack of guys that are all in there. And um, you talk about something, some great culture of just we haven't had a, we haven't had the same number one man at a meet yet this year. Um, and, and we have a tight spread, 20 seconds from our number one guy to our number five guy. So I don't care who starts, but just make sure five's within 20 seconds. And when you can start to do that, the national championships in that huge field, um, you can really start talking about being a uh, top 10. And like I said, Bethany has the same kind of race that she had at Wisconsin. She's got an excellent chance to be an All-American, which I think we've only had five here at um, Furman, um, and she's a freshman. Um, so the, we're into some rarefied air and uh, super excited to get on that bus. And, uh, you know, anytime you can do something you've never done before, um, I, think that's, I think that's saying a lot, especially after we've been here for 10 years, and I think we've accomplished some good stuff. Well, I'll throw it in there also, and I don't even know if Coach Gary knows this because we're, we're working on it now, but if any Furman fan wants to join us on Thursday, between 10 and 10.30, we're going to send off the team to the, the national championships. This is a big deal. Uh, so we're going to reach out to all of our students, faculty, staff, all of our athletic teams. Everyone's a part of it. Uh, but if you want to join us at Alley Gym on Thursday between 10 and 10.30 uh, for send-off for the team. And then if you want to, you're welcome to meet us in Tallahassee and come down for the race and get an experience like you've never seen. But this is the elite of the elite, uh, the national championships, and we're so honored and blessed to have Furman participating both on the men's side and the women's side. And thank you, Robert, for everything that you do. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks no, for having No me. pressure. Go win, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Robert, thanks. All right. This is Inside Furman Athletics. I am Dan Scott. Robert Gary taking his leave. Jason Donnelly hanging around as we get set to uh, play Ask JD the AD. Get some questions for him along with some other topics we'll be discussing. If you missed – Saturday here at Paladin Stadium. I thought I had the graphic. I don't. We had the Hall of Fame induction as well as uh, honoring um, Bobby Johnson and, of course, our uh, senior day here at Paladin Stadium. Capped it off with a 37-31 victory over VMI. And uh, it's not been quite the football season we had hoped for, but to close out the home portion of the schedule that way was uh, phenomenal. And one more game coming up for the Paladins, and that will be uh, at Samford on Saturday, uh, a 1 o'clock Eastern kick in the central time zone. So we're, uh, we're kind of looking forward to that, he said 
uh, not so convincingly. Um, and then, of course, we've got the, uh, the multi-team event coming up here basketball-wise this weekend. Furman and Radford on Friday, Radford and Navy on Saturday, and Furman and Navy on Sunday. So we got a lot going on. And uh, our sports information people are scrambling. Jason, I have said this on a number of occasions. Uh, my job at certain times of the year causes me to be on the road a lot and to be away from home a lot. You couldn't pay me enough money to be in sports information. Yeah, the, the, those people just the, – the, this, this industry does not give them the credit that they deserve for – all of the work that they do that makes people like me look reasonably good. Yeah, we. we I, I really appreciate. It. It's a great segue into what we're going to talk about in the next, you know, few minutes. But our our staff has gone all of everyone, coaches, staff, administrators have gone above and beyond um, this fall. I mean, our, our everything that we've done on and off campus has been first class and done right. The support's been incredible. You know, but our, our sports information team, our media relations team, they're one down. You know, one of our mm -hmm. members of the team has been has been ill and out, and um, they're doing double, triple duty on many a night. And the information they provide, this is led by Hunter Reed, and they just do remarkable, remarkable work. So we're very thankful to them. I'm also, you know, we have this beautiful view. We're looking outside at the beautiful football stadium, and I, I think of Todd Duke and his operations staff and the way that they've worked. I think of Ty Osborne. Uh, in his marketing team for the work that they've done. I think about our ticketing team, our operations team, uh, all the wonderful things that have been going on at Furman. But we're blessed. You know, people have been working really hard. One of the things we're looking forward to is is we want everybody to take some time off for Thanksgiving. You know, we, we've, got a, we've got a number of games coming up this weekend. We've got a number of basketball games that are taking place. We've got an away football game. We've got our cross-country meets, national championships. Uh, but we need our – you know, volleyball. Volleyball is in, the, in their playoffs. We've got a lot going on. But – we want our people to take some time off for the Thanksgiving break, and, and we're looking forward to that, and we wish everyone all the best for the holiday. But it is a good chance for everyone to catch their breath and to make this transition from our fall sports season into our winter sports season that we're in right now. Um, but we're really blessed. Robert mentioned one more thing to me for the fans that may be listening and may be interested. Um, there's going to be a, a, a sort of game watch of the meet on Saturday uh, here in the Pierce Horton building on Saturday uh, what I love about it, it's our student athletes are organizing it. So they're, they're doing it for each other. And it's one of the coolest parts of our department is the way everyone supports each other. So Cameron Ponder, who's one of our lead runners on the men's side, uh, has been organizing with our SAC representatives on the soccer side, and they're going to get something going on Saturday. So stay tuned for that. Don't know uh, all the logistics on it. But on Saturday when the team is racing at Tallahassee, uh, there's an opportunity for everyone to be a part of that as well. You know what was really cool? Uh, I think it was Brian Lambert who – texted me some pictures uh, after the uh, men's basketball game at Louisville. The women played here at Timmins Arena. And when that game was finished, they put the end of the, the men's game against Louisville up on the two video boards. And everybody who was there stayed. They said there were probably two or 300 people who stayed in Timmins and watched the last part of regulation and the overtime. And he sent me photos of, of uh, the video board and some of the fans there. That, that was, it was great to see people being invested in that. Well, we had the same thing going on in the Hall of Fame. You know, one of the things that people don't always realize is that w there's multiple events taking place at the same time. We mm -hmm. don't have enough dates to do it all. Um, you know, you're planning a lot of these events, um, you know, the Hall of Fame, for example, the Friday night before a football game. Uh, Jackie was playing a home game. Men's basketball's on the road. Cross country's in the championships. You know, there's so much going on. Volleyball is playing at the same time. Um, that's why the stands aren't out in some of the sections of the stadium because we're, you know, there's shared resources in, at a mid-major level. Um, but as we're going through this process, um, we had the Hall of Fame, and we, we honored our honorees on Friday night. It was a beautiful ceremony, and everything went great. And at the very end of the ceremony, the last thing that I said to everybody, I say, for those of you that want to stick around, it's 67-67, we're going overtime in Louisville. And everyone stayed and watched the game. And they were watching overtime together, and our president, and our VPs, and um, our alumni, our Hall of Famers. And when the team won, everybody went crazy. And it was just a, a, such a great feeling of euphoria. And the reason we, we got to remember this is that that's why sports are so important at Affirmant. That's why an athletics department is so important um, at a university because it's the lifeblood of what you do for your institution. And there's so many wonderful things that take place at an institution academically and socially and community service and civic-minded, driven, and all the different things that we do here. Um, it's the sports that pull it all together. You know, it's the sports that at the end of the day uh, is the outlet and the opportunity to come together. And, 
And I say this a lot, like a lot of our fans, when they come to games, they're not necessarily always coming just to watch the game. They might not be the expert at a football or a basketball um, or another sport or a soccer. There's a lot of sports they might not even understand. It's coming together. It's coming together in, in, as a student, as a faculty member, staff, alumnus, a fan. Um, and the impact is great. I love the work that's going on, um, not just for, for the season ticket holders and fans, but also for there's a lot of service organizations that are coming to be a part of this. And there's a lot of different areas that we're touching. Um, and it's just a great sense of pride to represent Furman in this way in terms of what we do. But that being said, I want to get into some stuff that we want to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, Dan, is a little bit about football in terms of where we're at and what's going on. Because I think part of it is just to understand where we are with football. And, and part of it is we've got to have a conversation with our fan base about a larger concept of what's going on in college athletics. Because it is changing and it's changing quickly. And I think it's important for everybody to know that. Um, specific to football, we love our guys. We love our team. We're always proud uh, of our Paladins in terms of what they do. But this has been a hard year. And, I, and, I, and I'd love to talk more about it. Um, it's been a challenge, and I would say that 2021 has been a challenge. When you look at challenges that we've gone through as a program, um, challenges that we've had on the field, you know, it, it's been disheartening at times um, to be in a game. Like when we're playing East Tennessee State, you know, we've got the game wrapped up. You've got 90 seconds to go. You just need a couple stops. You just need a couple plays to go your way, and then you're competing for a championship, you know, when you beat East Tennessee State. When we're going on the road and we're playing at Chattanooga and Western and we're coming up short in terms of where we are, it's very frustrating for people as we go through that process. So we as an administration know that. We as a, um, you know, leaders of the programs understand that. Um, but I do want to couch some things relative to where we are. Um, it's a unique time in college sports. And it's, and it's a unique time in the sense that um, our fan base is going to have to buckle up and understand what we're going through here from a bigger picture perspective. COVID has put a wrinkle uh, into college athletics that's going to be felt for the next three or four years. And what that means is that you're going to see students are going to change institutions. You're going to see students of every sport uh, are going to move around, and it's up to institutions to adapt to those changes or you're not going to, you're not going to be successful um, in, in your endeavors. And challenges that we have when we're looking at this at Furman, and a lot of these are specific to football and in a lot of cases basketball, but other sports, is changes in legislation when it comes to transfer portal, when it comes to name, image, and likeness, when it comes to just legislation. They're talking about unionization of, of sports teams that's going on around it. So there's a lot, you know. So we have to be prepared for what those changes are. As an administration, it's up to us, and I could see this coming before we got to this point. This is part of my assessment being new here, is we've got to look at what we are, what we do well, and what we need to do better. And our institution is, is basically set up as a four-year undergraduate institution with an excellent academic uh, experience. We have the highest admission standards in our conference. We've got the highest academic standards in our conference, and we're proud of that. We want that. So we want to represent the best um, on the field and off the field that we can be. But there's challenges that come with it, and the challenges that come with it is that how do you work through an environment in college athletics where we've gotten into a little bit of a, a modern-day free agency? You know, it's the point where people are changing teams and are able to make those changes quicker then an institution might be able to provide that level of support as we go through. So as a coaching department or institution, administratively, we've got to talk about things such as the ability for students to be able to transfer and what does that mean within an institution. Uh, we've got to talk about master's programs. You know, how do we retain talent? How do we replace talent uh, in terms of the different things that we're doing? We've got to talk about how do we embrace name, image, and likeness and how do we support that uh, administratively in terms of our department. So. Um, the thing I'd want our fan base to know is we're aware of these things, we're aware of these challenges, and we've got to continue to work through them and, and adapt, but we can't lose our soul when we do it. And what I mean by that is that we've got to tr stay true to who we are as Furman, we've got to know what we're trying to accomplish, we've got to look at what our model is in terms of where we're going. Um, but other state schools, one of the challenges we've had is that they're more apt and they're more able to make these adjustments quicker based on how they're built and how they're constructed. So it's become a bit of a challenge for us inside the conference that we're dealing with right now. Well, and, and you know, one of the things that I think points out exactly what you're talking about is, is the the difference of the on-the-field talent, but even more than that, the experience level when Furman went to Chattanooga. And Chattanooga doesn't try to hide this. I mean, they, nope. they put this in their notes package. Chattanooga played this season, is playing this season with three seventh-year players, 11th, 11 sixth-year players, 14 fifth-year players. Yep. Seventh year and sixth year, they got 14 in that category plus 14 fifth-year players. Yep. Um, 
that that is obviously more than anybody in the country at our level, maybe anybody in the country at any yeah. level. And I, and I'll be honest with Dan, we're still there to beat them. Yeah, right. And and, and, that's, and, and that's that, that was my point. Yep. There's no excuses in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. I think what we're trying to articulate a little bit is people <clears> are going to have to know that the model right now is different. So where we are in a journey is we're in a four year journey where we're bringing in recruits at 16, 17, 18 year olds. And we're trying to develop them into being the best young men and women they can be. And they're going to be here for a four-year journey so they can move on and leave. And the challenges we have, leave to have these great lives that we want them to have, the success of being a firm and alumni. The challenge that we have is when we're dealing with programs that are able to make changes in real time very quickly because of the combination of COVID and the transfer portal. It's, it's those two different factors at the same time. It's going to change the way that we have to approach success when we talk about athletics. So we've got to know what our model is. We've got to commit to what that is. One of the biggest challenges that football has had, um, you know, when Darren Granger left at the time that he did, you know, he was being counted on as a starting quarterback for this program. And however you evaluate what it was going to be with Darren and Hamp, uh, Sisson, who's a great quarterback as well, is that they were both competing to have a one-two punch the way that they were used in the fall of two, 2019. In the fall of 19, Darren took X amount of games where he took snaps. Hamp did the same. They started different games as they went through. But when you lose a player of that caliber, it, it, you're going into a season with your program that you've got to be able to adjust on the fly relative to where we, where we are. And our, our staff got caught flat-footed relative to that position. Now, that's, not, that's just one position, but it is a key position relative to where you are. In the model that we have, you've got one quarterback and you've got another emerging freshman quarterback uh, in Jace who's coming on and doing a great job. But – there's a patience that comes with that process in terms of that position. It's the responsibility of the coaching staff to get ahead of these things and to see these things coming. And in fairness to that coaching staff, they're going through a new model. You know, they, when they got this process started, the transfer portal did not exist. When they got this process started, COVID was not a factor in terms of where these things are. So uh, when we look at the results on the field in 2021, we're not where we want to be uh, from a competitive standpoint. But we have the right coach in place. Um, you know, Clay Hendricks earned a contract extension at the end of the 2019 season. This mm -hmm. was something that was agreed upon then. Clay had been coming off of FCS playoff appearances, a Southern Conference championship, doing everything that we wanted him to do and execute on the field, and he earned that, that contract extension at that time. Uh, due to COVID, we didn't announce it till later. You know, I think some people have asked, it's one of the questions we've gotten, is, is what was with the contract extension after we didn't play well in the spring of 2021? That contract extension was done well before that. It just was announced at the time. And what we go through as an administration, we've got our own challenges relative to COVID and other things when we do communications in terms of timing that we go through relative to where we are. But one, one question that we received is, what are the expectations for your program? And they're really simple, and this is where Clay does a great job with this, is that the first and foremost thing is we're an academic institution that prides itself on individual personal development for our team. And Clay is an outstanding role model for this program in terms of who he is as a teacher, in terms of who he is as a man, who he is as a husband, as a father, um, as a man of faith. He, he, he does all the things that we want the leadership to be. He's respected by our alumni. He's done it as a part of this program. So he's earned the right to, to lead this program. The second piece that Clay does that's really important when we talk about expectations is Furman has a, a very high academic standard that you have to be able to recruit to in one part of it. You've got to be able to retain when you go through academically, and you've got to graduate the type of student athletes that we bring to, bring to Furman. So you, you've got to know the kind of person that you are as a coach when you come to Furman. You've got to want to embrace that. And our most successful coaches have figured out how to go about that, how to, how to have elite academic and athletic athletes on the field. And it's just different than some of our peers in our own conference, but that's what Furman's built to be. The third part of it is you have to come here with embracing the challenge of competing to win championships on a year-in, year-out basis. That's the expectation from our administration. That's the, that's the basis that we have from our fan base. That's something that we're capable of doing. So in our coaches' meetings when we're talking about these things, I say to them all the time, I want to know if there's a reason why we can't, what is that reason? And we've got to have realistic expectations when we go through that. But the standard's the same. You know, We're here to compete to win championships and to be the best firm that we can be. That's a high standard, and that's a lot to take on as we go through it. But we invest in that way. We put our time in that way. We put our energy in that way. Uh, so the standard is extremely high in terms of what we're going to do. When a program gets to a point that we don't see that progress, when a program gets to a point where we're looking at it saying, why are they not achieving? We've got to take a hard look and evaluate. The same way that Clay, at the end of this season, he's got to go back and say, okay, let's evaluate where we're at as a program. He's got to look at 
his personnel. He's got to look at his staff. He's got to look at his success. He's got to look at all the factors relative to those measurements in terms of where we are from a program. And that's the job of a head coach. That's what they got to do. They got to come in. They got to look at it, and they got to know. And for us, as we look ahead to next year, we should expect to see improvement, and we should expect to be competing for a championship because that's the standard that we set from the inside out. The last couple of things when we're looking at evaluations of staff, um, how do they do when it comes to compliance and culture? You know, are they a part of our campus community? Do they get it? Um, are they making the right decisions? Are they ethical? Are they, are they doing the right things? Um, and part of that is just how do you engage your alumni? And, and Clay's done an outstanding job with the FFPA and with our fan base of doing that. And the last factor is, is revenues and, and philanthropy. And, and our football program is doing great. You know, they've had a great season. We're very thankful to our fan base because they've supported our initiatives. But our revenues are way up relative to the fan experience in terms of engagement. You know, we were leading the Southern Conference in attendance for a long time this year and be interested to see how it all plays out in the end. Uh, but in addition to that, the fundraising and support of our sports, football being one of them, has been off the charts. You know, we've had tremendous success and tremendous support. So we look at all those things in a holistic way in terms of where we're going. Um, next year is a big year for us for football. You know, we've got a chance here to, to get our positions right, to get our people right, to get where we need to be, to look at where we came up short and to really press on next year to get back for championships. But we also still need to be realistic. We've we got to compete against a model that right now is not a level model, and we we got to still overcome that at Furman relative to where we're going. Yeah, Furman does not have a lot in common with a great number of the schools in this conference based on, on what you were just talking about. And you can always play the woulda, coulda, shoulda game, but the thing I keep going back to with all of the troubles that we've had, and there's no secret, Clay has, has talked about this openly. George has talked about it openly. This is a game. College football is quarterback-driven, and mm -hmm. our quarterback play has not been what we wanted it to be here in 2021. And yet we're two plays away, basically. A, a stop at uh, against East, East Tennessee State and, and one more play either offensively or defensively at Western Carolina, and we're going to Samford on Saturday playing for a playoff right. spot. As, as difficult as things have been in this season, if you, if you look at it from that standpoint, and, and this is the, the thing, and, and Clay and I, you know, we do our interview on Thursday. We, we do about two four-minute segments, and we probably talk for 35 or 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it's like I always say about being on the air, the best stuff never makes the air. Yep. But you know, he is always talking about how much he believes in this team, how much they're getting better, how much better we are than the spring. And, and when, you, when you look at it, if you can remove the – the fanatic part of being a fan and look at it with cold logic. Yeah, there are some issues, but I don't think that there are issues there that are going to be so difficult to clean up that this can't be a championship team next year. We were yeah. that close this season. And I think that's what's driving all of us crazy, you know, and, and I'd say the person that feels the most sense of pressure and craziness about this is Clay. Yeah. You know, and we've gone through a process here where, um, you know, we're competing to be the best of who we can be, and we've made little mistakes along the way that have, that have impacted the result. You know, ultimately, our win-loss record is impacted by small things, by mm -hmm. decisions. But it's those inches that you go through that process. It's, it's a sack late in a game. It's a, it's a lack of a stop. It's a ball going through hands. It's a fumble. Um, it's a snap against VMI two years ago that, that sets a whole season on a trajectory one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And what you learn with winning programs over time is those winning programs make those adjustments, and they make those adjustments both in personnel, they make those adjustments in staff, they make those adjustments in culture. They make those adjustments in on-the-field execution. And those are our expectations for the program is that they need to take care of the little details that add up to the big things that create a championship program in terms of where we're going. But um, our expectations are simple. You know, we're coming out this weekend. Our, our job is to go beat Sanford on the road at Sanford. That's, that's our job. And then our job this offseason is to look at the whole product, figure out where we are, make the adjustments we need to make, and come back next year competing for a championship and that's just the standard. It's that simple. And it's the standard in all of our sports. So it's not any different for football than it is for others. And then we as administrators have got to look at where are we at this moment in time relative to where we are. Are we making the right decisions? Are we doing the right things? Um, do we have the people in a position to be successful for where they can be successful? Then it's our job to know the barriers to success that we're dealing with in terms of what we're doing. Um, but we're, we're excited for Clay. We're optimistic for where things are headed um, we know what the expectations need to be and what we need to get done, and, and we're headed in that direction. I mean, we are pushing the hour point, and we have not even gotten to the questions yet. Let's go yet. to the questions. You want, you, yeah. you want to go to the questions? Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do that. 
Uh, we've had some submitted, as we always do. Uh, the, the first one that was sent to us is the SOCON looking into the possibility of expanding. Yeah, great question. And uh, being honest, there's been a lot of conversation around conference realignment uh, at the athletic director and president level, uh, commissioner level. There's been a lot going on. Um, I can tell you that the Southern Conference has spent an extensive amount of time, the ADs, the presidents, discussing the future of the league, uh, where we are today, our viability, where we are. Um, we have a lot of assets. So, so Furman and others in our conference have been asked by other leagues to join those leagues uh, to figure out what is in the best interest of us, both at the Southern Conference and elsewhere. We're also doing the same process from within the Southern Conference to look at a potential expansion within the conference. One thing that we're confident in is if the 10 teams that we have now, the 10 institutions that are part of the Southern Conference, choose to stay and are part of this conference, we really like our makeup as it exists right now. Now, the makeup of our conference has a lot of challenges to it because we have private schools, we've got academies, and we've got public schools. So we're not all like each other, and we've got to determine where we're going. So the conversations we're having from a leadership level are – what is the future of the Southern Conference? What do we want it to look like? What are the strategic partnerships around us that may be good fits for our conference? Some of these things may take time to flesh out. Uh, where the process is starting is it, it began with Texas and Oklahoma, and it's working its all way down now into the group of five, where it is with the Sun Belt Conference and Conference USA. That's kind of the level that we've gone to now. You're going to see some FCS schools that are jumping up to FBS. Those schools that are making that move have been planning this move for a long time. And they've been investing their resources. They've been planning for this. Um, I've been watching JMU's growth for a long time in terms of what they're trying to do, uh, where they're trying to get to. So for them, that's the move that they're looking to make. Um, we are going through the same type of assessment internally at Furman to look at who we are, what we want to be, what we want to do, and where we want to go with it. And uh, we feel like we're in a really good spot for Furman in, in terms of what we're trying to invest in and where we go. But Yes, conference realignment is, is on the, the tip of every tongue of every commissioner, AD, and president right now, and the Southern Conference is no different that we're looking at that as well. All right, next question. Talked about seeing a lot of effort into making the game day experience for Furman football what it was this year and, and, and how, how much better it was for a fan to be uh, at Paladin Stadium. So the question is, what do you do for an encore? How do, how do you build on that for 2022? Because you can never rest on your laurels. Right. You, know, you know this. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I don't. I mean, it's, it, for us, it's, what we're here to do at Furman is continue to push the boundaries of what we think is possible. And I think it's important for our fan base to know a lot of the decisions and execution that you saw here this year when we were able to get our fan base back for football – uh, similar to what we talked about with Clay, these decisions were made in the fall of 2019. Mm -hmm. You know, the, when you go through a process of the season, you're evaluating in that season and you're preparing for the next season. And you've been a part of these meetings and as a part of our external team. Um, but we go through a process during the season. We look at what we're doing, what we're doing well, what we can fix in, in real time, and what we need to adjust in the postseason. So the next step in our process will be to have a postseason meeting and to look at all the different aspects of our football operation to go through those aspects and look at where we're going to go next. Uh, we've got a lot of great ideas. We've got a lot of things that we'd like to do, that we'd look to do. Um, so much of this, just to be candid about it, uh, has to do with what we started, which is an emphasis on the students, the faculty, the staff, our alumni, and our season ticket holders. And we've really spent a lot of our time over the last few two years focusing on those five buckets. We have to grow uh, in order to be a successful athletic department, a successful institution, and a successful football program when it comes to our impact in Greenville and the upstate. So I would expect to see continued improvements that will, that will add to those enhancements in terms of the things we're doing. Sometimes the challenge is as simple as scheduling. There's some teams that I would like to play right now, and scheduling is done five years out. You know, scheduling is one of those things where you've got to catch up to the schedule and set for where you're going to go in the future. Um, but there's some strategic partnerships that we've been working on, uh, both corporate, scheduling. Um, there's some things we're going to continue to do with regards to the facility. There's some things we're going to continue to do when it comes to engagement of fans. Uh, but we're excited, and, and for us, we've got, um, we've got a, a six months to work on our off-season plan so we can be prepared uh, to host in Paladin Stadium next fall. But we're, we're on it, and we're looking forward to the next steps. Yeah, just so our, our fans know, everything that you saw here at Paladin Stadium this fall was on track to happen for the fall of 2020. Correct. That did not happen because of COVID, and obviously we could not do it in the spring. You mentioned scheduling uh one of the other questions was uh who are our out of conference football opponents for next season yeah we're, we're gonna play five home games and um I, in my belief in scheduling I, I allow that, that that's the coaches the coaches they go through the process they schedule the games they work on their on their schedule and one of the things i was going to mention as a segue you know we're talking about basketball um i'm really proud of bob Ritchie and his staff they've scheduled up and mm -hmm. that was one of the things i wanted to talk about 
uh, in addition to that. Um, they've taken on a more competitive schedule. And the conversations that we've had with Bob, and I really appreciate him taking this mindset, uh, he's gained in confidence both for his himself and his program, but also the stature of where they are. Um, I would say it to him, and I'd say the same thing to Clay. I'd say it to any of our other coaches. If you're sitting there in the last game of the season, and an example of Bob, if you're Monday night and you're in Asheville and you're in the tournament and you've got to play that championship game, I, I as a coach, as an administrator, would rather have felt that we've done all the work we needed to do leading up to that to give us a chance to, to get into – the NCAAs without having to win that championship game. That takes all the pressure off when you get to that moment. Obviously, everyone wants to win the championship game, get the automatic qualifier. It's the same way with, with basketball and football. Is you, you need to schedule up to your opponents relative to where you're going to go. Now, the challenge we have is that as much as you're ambitious in your scheduling, you can't always get the games that you want. So sometimes you can't get people to play you. Sometimes you can't get them to play you at home. Uh, sometimes you've got to get opponents that you otherwise might not have played in a given year because you just got to get the game. Um, but our football staff's been working on their schedule. Whenever they're ready to announce it, uh, I rely on m my man Hunter Reed to do that and to tell us when we're going to go about it. But we will play five home games this upcoming football season, and we're looking forward to getting that out there soon. Uh, similarly with basketball, we, we are ambitious enough that we want to get the best possible opponents to play us in Timmins, and we want to get the best possible opponents to play us in the well. Part of the vision for the well uh, is not just to play really good Southern Conference games on the weekends there, but to try to go out and get teams that would otherwise not play us in Timmins, but they'll be willing to play us uh, in the Bon Secours Arena. And having done scheduling before, I know for a fact that the Power Fives and the Big East, when they look at scheduling, they're, they're not coming into Timmins. There's, there's no way that they're going to do it. But they would consider playing you in a larger venue such as the Well. Uh, and those are the type of things we're going to do. We're going to leverage relationships that we have with the NCAA. We're going to leverage relationships we have with Division I teams. Um, but this past year was just not a year to do it because we all got caught in a COVID cycle. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is we, we committed to games contractually two years ago that we still haven't even played. So there, there's a degree of that that comes off of that. Um, I have teased Bob about this. I said, Bob, it would be a lot easier for us to schedule some of these games if you, can't, if you wouldn't stop beating the Villanovas and the Louisvilles of the world because that doesn't help our case to go get a great game. Um, in the well. But we're going we're gonna to keep working on it. We're going to get to that point. Um, another one of the questions you had on the list was, would we ever bring back the, the point set classic? Um, we've got some ideas to do that as well, to do a multi-tournament team event. Um, I don't know if it would be the point set classic or not, but we've got some ideas of how do we maximize that resource and how do we bring some teams in. I, I'll give our basketball staff a lot of credit. They brought in some multiple tournament teams this year. We, you know, we got Radford coming in, we got Navy coming in because they were creative enough to do things like that. Uh, so I, in my mind, all these things are moving forward together um, with a larger plan to continue to give great exposure for the university and give great exposure for our athletic department. And, you know, the other thing that goes into being able to convince a Power 5 team to come play us at the well, it helps that this is now, again, an NCAA tournament mm -hmm. venue. Yep. So getting the uh, opportunity to play on – a floor where they, they might play if it's a tournament year or a similar arena to some place they might get sent uh, at the end of the season in the NCAA tournament. That's got to be an attraction. Yeah, and we, we want to stop the tar start at the top of the list and, and, and look at the schools in our region that would potentially be playing there in the NCAA tournament. So you want to look at the Dukes and the North Carolinas, and you want to look at the local schools, the Clemsons and the South Carolinas, and say, who would want to take on this opportunity to play us here? Um, and we're, we're getting closer. We're inching our way there. Uh, relative to what we want to do. But we've got a vision for what that is. Sometimes you've also got to look at taking some – we've had some – we had some games that would have been played in the well this year that because of COVID just did not come together because of scheduling challenges. We had games that were contracted that we were working on um, that I would say were high-level games but not necessarily the prestige game that we've wanted yet. Can't wait to get to the point where we can announce that big prestige game where you can pack the Bon Secours Arena with 15,000 people the way they do for the NCAA tournament – and just have that experience. So we're heading that way. It's going to take time. Um, it was a really good opportunity for Bob to play at Belmont uh, this past week because it gave him a chance to see a program that has invested, that has had success, and I'd say probably had success before they invested. And they've made a lot of decisions relative to building basketball as a brand for the type of things they're going to do. It was really good for some of our trustees to be on that trip, for them to see that um, and to see that level of investment. And, again, I've seen it. I know what it is, and I also know the steps that I have to take in that process. Um, and the work that we're doing around Timmins Arena, we, we've done phase one, which is under progress right now. And phase one consists of the offices, the locker rooms, the video rooms that are part of that. Um, but our fan base should know, like, right now we're displaced. Like we, we don't have locker rooms right now. And that was a decision our coaches took. 
you know, I said, do you want to take the locker rooms on at the end of the season and have no distraction during the season, and do you want to take them on right away? And they both wanted to take them on right away. They, they want to see this progress done. Uh, one of the questions that we had also talked about the setup in Timmins. Well, we're trying to do some creative things in Timmins because right now, as an example, the thirsty pout in the room in the back of the arena, <clears throat> it's offline. You know, it's a locker room because right now we don't have locker rooms because we're in the process of making these adjustments. So you're going to see some things in Timmins this year uh, that are a bit makeshift because we're in the process of making a transition relative to where we want to be. Um, there'll be return stand, stands and seating. Um, but our goal for Timmins is really simple. We want to have a packed house, sold out atmosphere, standing room only, loud students, fans, alumni, uh, people cheering from, the, from their seats and get to that point of creating an ultimate game environment. And I guess my ask of our fan base uh, today would be to consider coming out. We've got two men's basketball games coming up on Friday and on Sunday. We've got women's basketball games coming up on Saturday and on Monday. So in addition to everything else we've got going on, the best way that you can help us as a fan base is really, really simple. Um, the, the number one way you can do, you can help us is to engage us, to reach out, get engaged, figure out who you want to be a point of contact with our department. And that can be Dan Scott, that can be Dwight Covington, that can be Aaron Wissing, that can be Daniel Ray, that can be our coaches. But get involved. The second way that you can help us is be a season ticket holder and get engaged with our programs. The attendance and the season ticket participation in our programs matters. It matters more than our fans may know. It makes an impact not just on the players that are playing in the games and on the coaches in, in there. It impacts recruiting. It impacts our administration. It impacts our revenue. It impacts our ability to operate. I love the stories of our fans that don't miss games, both home and away. I know who they are. I know who the, how devoted they are. That matters. It matters a lot to the student athletes and coaches when they see you traveling with the team and that you support them the way that you do. For me, as an example, I would love to go to every football game We've got 18 sports going on simultaneously, so we've got to pick and choose how do we support these teams in an equitable way. We know where our priorities are, but how do we support them the way that they all need to be supported and be visible that way? And the third thing you can do is support the fundraising initiatives that we have. Um, and I kind of make this a call to action relative to heading into the holidays for Thanksgiving and Christmas. There's a lot of things that we're all asked to support, and, and God knows that my wife, she's got her passions, I've got my passions, there's things that we support but if you believe in the Paladins and what we're trying to do, we, we need the support to be able to push the model forward, and we need the participation to show that Furman Athletics matters. And it's got to matter to our fan base as much as it's got to matter to us because that's what drives the engine forward. That's ultimately what allows us to do the type of things we need to do. And we don't need everything from, from any one person. You know, It's just doing the best that people can do in that process. But we do need support in terms of what they can do and making Furman a priority. That. It's that simple. Um, and everyone, in terms of what they can do, their time, their, their talent, their treasure, it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, I, I was talking about you at the beginning of the show. Your, your time and your talent is our greatest asset for, for Furman, is the things that you do for this fan base, the things you do for our teams. Like I, I respect the hell out of you for going on the road the way you did and, and not saying a word about it, but just doing it and, and sleeping on couches and traveling all over the place and putting yourself at personal risk when you're making these travel. It's not an easy thing to do, but I – I thank you for doing it, and I really admire you for your passion for the Paladins. Well, I appreciate you saying that because the longer you went here, I was beginning to think that you really didn't need me. You were just sitting here <laughs> running through all these things. I could be on that side pointing like a director and saying go no. and stop and we got a, all of this stuff. But uh, we got a good thing going, Dan. And yeah. I just would encourage everyone to enjoy it, enjoy the journey, you know, enjoy the precious present where we are, win or lose where we are. Um, stay committed to these kids. Stay committed to these coaches. Stay committed to our our mission of what we're trying to do. we got a special thing going, and our greatest challenge is how do we grow it? And we can grow it, um, you know, you catch more, catch more flies with, with uh, honey than you do vinegar. You know, we, we've got we've to bring our friends to these events. We've got to bring our friends to these games. We've got to bring our network, our churches, our, our, our youth groups that we care about, and we got to expose them to the Paladins. And when you spend time with our student-athletes and you spend time with our coaches, you're going to feel that sense of excellence. And then through that excellence, we'll continue to have better and bigger results relative to where these things are. And our, you know, like I said to Robert, we want him to win a national championship. That's not his job to win the national championship, but it is a goal. It's something that mm -hmm. he's striving to. It's just like Clay with football. We want football to win a national championship. That goal's not changing. That goal's still on the goal sheet of everything that they do year in, year out, relative to where they are. And it is possible to do it at Furman, and it's already been done. And what we've got to do is we've got to adapt to modern times. We've got to adapt to modern challenges we got to put a team on the field that's reflective of the excellence, and we got to coach them and do our jobs. And 
That's what Bob Ritchie's trying to do. That's what Clay's trying to do. That's what all of our coaches are trying to do. Doug Allison, everyone else that's a part of it, Jeff Hole with golf, is they're trying to compete at their highest possible level with a firm and base in terms of what we do. Well, it's been, uh, as it always is, uh, a very intriguing, uh, fact-filled conversation. And I will remind our fans that this is the – final one of these we're going to do until we get to the first of the year with the, everything that's going on and people taking some time off uh, in the month of December. Inside Furman Athletics will return in January, but then so will these monthly visits with uh, Jason Donnelly uh, through uh, about April. So we'll, we'll have another four or five of these after the first of the year to continue to talk about some of the things and, and get your input as fans, things you want to know from Jason Donnelly about what's going on here at Furman University. Well, Dan, happy holidays. Hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. Most importantly, I hope you take some time off with your beautiful family. Uh, appreciate you. To our fans, uh, happy Thanksgiving to you, too. We'll look forward to seeing you at some Furman basketball games and greatly appreciate your support. I hope everybody has happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we will see you soon. Now, well, you can see my my, uh, my uh, off days are scheduled yes. ba- based on what the schedule is so yeah thanksgiving week looks pretty good right now we'll take it you you should (laughs) you deserve it all right that will uh, do it for this week's edition of uh, inside Furman athletics and again it will be our final edition until we get to the first of the year in january of 2022 and we look forward to having you along for the ride there and uh again we'll just remind you this is dropping on tuesday we've got basketball all week long men and women and the final football game on the road at sanford on Saturday. Check FermanPaladins.com for times, schedules, and we'd love to see you in Timmins Arena. For Jason Donnelly, for Robert Gary, I'm Dan Scott, as always, saying God bless you so long, everybody, and we'll see you again next time. Go Paladins!